you know, surveys are meant to be broad and not very deep. I'd like to go and begin with this morning with just a little bit of dip because it is both interesting and I think beyond interesting it's also uh, faith giving, uh, faith perceiving, and that's where we're going to start this morning, but we'll still be in the Old Testament. Let's begin the prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Somehow or other, Heavenly Father, in our lives, you rearrange things uh, this morning, so somehow or other, uh, we got an hour, we're, uh, we're going to spend this hour, our best this hour, in your life and your love again. So thanks for all of life and for this day and for this special hour together. And grant, Heavenly Father, that what we learn and what we know and who we are might serve your glory and at the same time give us, Heavenly Father, a deeper joy, a stronger purpose in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, if we'll start off, where I'd like to go is Exodus chapter 25. center to it, and depending upon which uh, book of the Bible you're reading, you'll find out also that Aaron had a uh, symbol of his priesthood, which was a large staff, and that would go into the ark occasionally. And, um, I'm not sure at what point, but there was a bit of manna. Okay? So you had these three kind of remembrance items I don't know how they kept the manna. Maybe that's why one of the uh, uh, descriptions of the ark does not include manna because somebody got in there and ate it or more than just got old and moldy or whatever. Anyway, not to get uh, too divine, uh, but this ark again was made of a special kind of wood that you could get in our desert, incidentally, acacia wood, uh, and they were a pretty good sized tree in the Middle East at that point. So this ark, and we'll just read it right now, starting with verse chapter 25 and verse 10. I'm just going to read it, and then we can come back and uh, take a look at the, if there are questions. Okay, so he's talking, God is, through Moses, talking to those who are the artisans who are going to build this ark. Had them make a chest of acacia wood, Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it, and fasten it to its four feet with two rings on one side, and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. Poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark, the testimony, I will give you. Okay, now, 
here's the important part. So pay special attention to this here. Because the ark is going to go into the Holy of Holies. So it will be in the center of the tabernacle, that is the huge tent as they're going across 40 years in the wilderness. But it will become, as a temple is built, it will become the centerpiece of the temple. Uh, and it's going to go into the Holy of Holies, that very special place in the temple. Okay? Thoughts? Questions? All right, let's keep going then. Verse uh, 17, the cover. Make an atonement cover. Um, and what's the three little words that are present in that word atonement? At one then. It is a place around which and through which the children of Israel will gather. It will provide that at one moment, um, but it will also be the place where God says, I will be there. I will be there. So again, make an atonement cover, pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim, okay, hang on to this, make two cherubim, angels, okay, make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one angel, one cherub, on one end, and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover, all covered with gold, at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. And the cherubim, and remember this too, the cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. And place the cover on top of the ark, and put in the ark the testimony, that is the Ten Commandments, which I will give you. And there above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant, or the testimony, I will meet you. Okay, that can be also translated, I will be there. Okay. There, above the cover, number 22 again, there, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. So it is the centerpiece of God's presence. So that the people can have that kind of comfort, that kind of identification, and know that where that ark is, there is God's presence, God's power, God's listening, God's giving. Thoughts? Now, I'm going to take a quick side trip again. Uh, and this is going to be real quick, but just enough to give you somewhat of an idea or a feeling. Uh, and we're going to go to uh, 1 Samuel. Um, uh, um, first Samuel, uh, uh, let's go to chapter 17. Well, no, let's go to, uh, let's see, chapter 5. Let's just see real quick. I've got that written down to the Christian until this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, page, well, it's first Samuel. First Samuel. Uh, num uh, verse or chapter uh, 4 okay chapter 4 page 193 page 193 uh, in your red Bible first Samuel chapter 4 we're just going to get a couple high problems here uh, just enough to give you an idea one of uh, Israel's in the early days of their uh, expansion into Canaan and becoming still the tribes, not a nation at all, but still the tribes. And as they go and they conquer corners and they conquer pieces and each of the 12 tribes, it's a part of this land of Canaan, the, the kind of the center and the one piece that, that uh, uh, holds them together, that binds them together is this heart. And the art is uh, in different places at different times and, uh, in the, this early years of, uh, uh, of their, 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 their 
their time in the, in the Holy Land. These first 400 years, actually, for the 12 tribes, uh, as we could read it and have a little bit in the Book of Judges. Okay, verse uh, uh, chapter 4. I'm just going to hit a couple of high spots here. Okay, now, the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. Again, one of their arch enemies. So the Israelites camped at Ebenezer. Ebenezer, occasionally, you know, when you come across that word, it's, it, it's a word of, of, of praise to God. Um, uh, our Ebenezer is the place where we say thank you. And it is one Old Testament word for thank you. But the Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. And when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon them the day before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord. Okay, now we're going to get serious. Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hands of our enemies. Again, the ark would be in different places at different times uh, in the uh, among the 12 tribes. But it wasn't stationed just in one place. It wasn't just a capital or a central worshiping place right now. We see that Shiloh is the place where the ark is. All right, now, uh, verse 5. Um, I, I, no, no, I'm sorry, verse 4. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is thrown between the cherubim, the two angels on top of the ark of the covenant. Right? And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, don't have to remember those names, they were bad dudes. Uh, you know, his two sons were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Now, verse 5, when the ark of the Lord's covenant came into that camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting? And then you were camp. I suspect it was because Kansas, we both of almost state yesterday. <laughs> but it's a big deal. <laughs> uh, and when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid a God has come into the camp, they happened. Uh, we're in trouble. Like nothing like this has ever happened before. Whoa, what's so good? It's in the hand of the mighty God. They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. And remember that. Be strong, Philistines, be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews. And they have been to you uh, as, as they have been to you. Be men. They're kind of encouraging one another. Philistines are. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers, and the ark of God was out. Now we're in trouble. The ark of the covenant was captured, and Eli's two sons, Phineas and Hophni, died. Okay, so this is the end of Israel as we know it. The center of their religious life and the center of their, uh, you know, 12 tribes with no uh, central headquarters, no central capital, uh, no central place, always a place of worship. Uh, they were without an identifying uh, symbol for them. And so this is, on the one hand, it is a deeply religious thing, but it's also a national or could be a kind of national. Um, now, uh, so, so the, this I'm going to read all this in a bit before. The, the Philistines take the, the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in their temple. Uh, Dagon, remember? D A G O N. Dagon. And Dagon is their God. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, they bring that, and as they place it in their place, they come in the next morning or the next week. 
and Dagon has flattened his face before the ark. Okay? And they set it back up. Happens again uh, when they come back in. Dagon is flattened his face in front of the ark. Uh, and also, all sorts of bad things are happening at this point in the Philistines. Uh, they, they, get, uh, they get all kinds of sickness and uh, uh, wilts on their bodies, tumors, uh, and they kind of figure out why is this? Well, it's because we've got this ark and it doesn't belong to it. So they return the ark to the Philistines, and once again, the Philistines have an identity. Okay? Uh, and they're going to also have some conversations about is there a special place where we need to uh, we need to keep this ark? Uh, uh, it's in the tabernacle now, but the tabernacle is falling apart. This this huge tent that they've used. What are we going to do with it? Thoughts, questions? Okay. Uh, let's just read once more. Okay. This centerpiece, this this um, uh, symbol, powerful symbol around which the twelve tribes have an identity. The twelve tribes do not have an identity with one another. They're still individuals. Let's go back once more, once more to Exodus uh, uh, chapter twenty-five. Which we read before, Exodus 25. Just want to read one part of this. Um, um, uh, and we're not going to read this this morning, but as uh, David defeats the Jebusites who own and who live on the property which will become Mount Zion in what will become Jerusalem. Um, and as they capture this, and uh, this is where David, uh, then as king, we'll get to him in just a second, but as David becomes king, he says, this is the place where God wants us to, to erect his temple. Uh, other nations, so on, other people who have, have uh, Temple, and we don't. We just have this traveling, uh, this traveling uh, ark that goes with us, and we need something that has more permanence, that has a, a higher sense of presence among the twelve tribes, uh, and so they have this this conversation. Point me that one of the biggest moments and one of the worst, worst moments in David's life, you may remember, is when they bring the tabernacle, the ark, is taken out of the tabernacle, what's left of it, and it's brought into the city of Jerusalem, and it is the centerpiece for now, for the first time in their life. They've had one king, Samuel, who didn't do very well, uh, but now they've got the best there is. So David is dancing before the ark, remember, as it comes up into the city, and the whole city is in turmoil because now they have a place for the ark. Not quite sure where they're going to put it, but they have a place and a purpose for the ark. Uh, so just pack that one away again, too. We're not going to read all of these ark references, but it's enough to say that this is a centerpiece for uh, the children of Israel. Now that they have a king, okay, now that they have a king, whoops, Again, uh, Exodus chapter 25, listen close. Okay, um, again, page 58, uh, uh, let's get verse 19, okay? Uh, let's uh, go back one seventy. Make an atonement cover. The covenant will bring all things together for the children of Israel, for the ark, and later for the temple. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half feet long, two and a half wide. Make two cherubim of the hammered gold at the ends of the covenant. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. 
make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. Cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the covenant of the testimony of the Ten Commandments, which I will give you. There, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Got the picture? Okay, now let's turn to uh, John. Uh, and we're going to turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, page 768. 768. Uh, and we're going to start with, with just verse 1 of 20. It's Easter. And we'll start with verse 1. John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples and John, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there where he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. Cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciples, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside Esau and believed. They still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary, <coughs> but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she said, they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Once more, I'm going to go back to verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white. See where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Was the exact description of how the ark of the covenant. So the angels, one at the bottom and one at the other, with their wings full. Point being, this is this is the ark, of the ark of God's presence, and the ark of God's presence, the ark of God's promise, the ark of, of God saying, "I will be there." That's kind of a, the headline you would put over the ark or over the meeting of the ark where God said, I will be there. Okay. So this little moment in resurrection history of our Lord and John is saying to us that the ark itself has long since been lost. But our Lord Jesus Christ is again precisely those words. I will be there. And we catch all of this from Exodus in the Old Testament and from John the New. Thoughts? Again, this is just this little aside, but a big kind of a nice, a kind of a nice aside because we will from time to time, if you read some of it here, without having you watching television and like some of the history books, and every once in a while they'll have some. A short or long uh, program on uh, Old Testament 
kind or art or any of the big symbols, and here will be in the event that has a whole program uh, on where the ark is today. <laughs> the ark is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God's presence. I will be there. Going therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you. Oh, thank you. Okay, thoughts? Then let's, let's uh, skip all the way back to uh, a new beginning for the nation of Israel. We've seen them now, if you remember from our time in the past, we've got, we've got two, the year 2000 BC, roughly, Abraham, son Isaac, son Jacob, his name is James II, Netanyahu, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting that for the, I think about the 46th time Netanyahu was, was elected Prime Minister of Israel <laughs> this past week. Um, uh, but what, what is interesting about that, the reason I even bring it up, is because Israel was a person, right? And the name Israel means one who struggles with or one who wrestles with God, which is the description of all of us in one way or another. Um, uh, and uh, and that the equal nation, little tiny nation, just a little people group called Israel, uh, almost roughly about 1900 years before our Lord was born, so 4,000 years ago, and Israel is once again in the lifetime of uh, many of us in, in 1946, I believe. Uh, is when Israel becomes a nation after the Second World War. Uh, and so there is this continuity, uh, which is, which is I, I think, powerful as we think about it, all the way from 2000 BC, if you will, to 2080. Uh, and the nation of Israel, in one form or another, in one place or another, has been a people group, not a nation like we have today, but a people group in different parts of our world. So uh, uh, we've got we've gone from 2000 BC, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to that. Remember that Jacob had goes into the land of Egypt. They end up very prosperous. They end up doing very well there until. The Pharaoh, whoever he was at that point, said, We gotta watch these Israelites are gonna take over our land. And so the next 350 years is a time of increasingly and deeper and more wretched uh, slavery. And so now they are uh, in roughly the year 500, 1500, 1500. Uh, in 1500, they are brought by Moses out of Egypt, freed from slavery, 40 years, across the Sinai Peninsula, and then that whole uh, Near East, lower Near East, between what is today Egypt and what is today Israel, uh, spending 40 years finding their way, God shaping them from a, a mob, okay, uh, 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 people who had no identity because they had been slaves for that long. Uh, and I wonder, there's no clear uh, explanation anywhere in the scriptures, uh, but they were without uh, leadership, uh, they were without uh, identity, they were without uh, their own place in Goshen all of a sudden. Now they are slaves, uh, it's almost wretched of people. They are without probably, in many respects, a religious identity. There is still, uh, uh, we know, uh, still the word about a Yahweh, a Moses, someplace along the line uh, of God, what God is going to send, what God is going to bring. But there are few indications of it. But finally now, in the year, roughly about the year 1500 B.C., um, Moses is called, and now they're in the wilderness, 40 years, and now what we went through 
two weeks ago, was a brief period of time. Yes, excuse me, excuse me. Well, I just want to mention, I think it's very ironic that <clears throat> after the separation of the Northern and Southern tribes, um, that the Northern tribes took on the name Israel, yeah. and they became the group of people that were basically shunned by the southern tribes who were supposedly the true Israelites, yeah. but they took on the name Judah, and it, it was kind of ironic that, that that separation took place and the name was associated with the people that were not faithful to God in the, in the eyes of the southern tribes. Yeah, and in fact, that's where we're, we're heading right now during that period of history, where after they're getting settled, and remember that last time we touched on, just barely touched on, Joshua, who led the children of Israel, mm -hmm. or the tribe, after Moses died, um, and then almost 400 years, almost 400 years, so a thousand years removed from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they are in, they find this promised land God gives them, and for 400 years during that period that we know in the scriptures as the judges, they are without a formal national identity. Every little tribe, the 12 of them, uh, kind of does its own thing. And they are vulnerable, they are attacked by enemies, by other tribal groups. And so it's, it's, a, it's a bad time, this time in, in uh, the period of the judges. And so now the people say, we need a king. The problem is that we don't have an identity. We don't have a standing army. We don't have any way of defending ourselves. And so what we need is, is a king, somebody who, that we can all follow, somebody who will be the leader of our nation that we identify with, and the one who will give us a national identity. The a prophet, probably one of the greatest prophets, is we just read a little bit from Samuel. Okay? So Samuel, and you need to just put his name in the back of your head if you haven't already, because he's one of the truly great uh, prophets. He was a prophet, he was a priest, he was a little tiny king, maybe in some respects as people uh, uh, honored him. But God says, okay, the people are calling for a king. This is going to be a learning experience for these people. This is going to be another learning experience. But let's give them, Samuel, what, what they want. And Samuel says, oh, no, 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 this, 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 you know, this is going to be bad. And God said, let them learn, let them learn, because this is part of my mission, that they will become a people who will be a blessing to all nations, even as I promised Abraham a thousand years ago. And so Samuel said, okay, I'll do whatever you want. And they find, remember the first king? Saul. All right, Saul, Saul. And Saul had his great moments and a whole lot of bad moments. And he is finally killed along with his sons uh, on the battlefield. Uh, but God has already prepared, and this is where we're going to go over just a few minutes right now, and that's 1 Samuel, okay? Um, uh, 1 Samuel, uh, and uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and I'll give you that in just a second here. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Hey. Two, oh two. First verse of chapter 17. Or not the first verse, but the headline. What do you read there? Page 2202. Two, oh two. First annual, chapter 17. That's probably one of the most famous stories in all the Holy Scripture. Of all the comes. Your gorilla Goliath, um, uh, which is, in fact, that's a book written by, by uh, Elder Schweitzer, uh, and I read it in German. I, I never was able to use that before, though I think about 60 years of it. We brothers and sisters in Christ, your gorilla Goliath, which is German for the 
the, the gorilla by the name of Goliath. It's absolutely useless, but this is a model that made up my preparation for my You might want to write that down. I don't know where that's coming from. But but the, the story probably that that is more famous than any other in the Old Testament life is David and Goliath. Uh, but let's go back a chapter. I mean, we're not going to go into 17. You know the story well, and it doesn't turn out well for Goliath, as I remember. <laughs> chapter 60. Chapter 60. I just love this chapter. Because it tells me God, God, God in his infinite wisdom and grace, uh, he, he just does the most unusual things just when we've got God figured out. Oh, yeah, I think I got that part of the way. Then he throws us a, a curve or a sinker or whatever it might be. Chapter 16, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 16. So the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Saul has been killed. Since I have rejected him as king over Israel, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. Stop weeping, Samuel, and get on with your life as a prophet. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be the king. Okay, so we know a little bit the son is going to come from Bethlehem, and his dad is going to be Jesse, which should remind us of a, probably about a month ago, remember? Uh, there was. Jesse's dad was, do you remember? Obed. Okay. And Obed's dad was Boaz. And his wife was Ruth. Yeah. His wife was Ruth. And so, uh, as uh, Samuel was told, I want you to go to Jesse and the house of Jesse. Uh, so we're back and we're back close to our, our dear friend and saint, Ruth. Uh, okay, uh, verse uh, verse two. But Samuel said, "How can I know? Saul will hear about it, and he will kill me." So Saul is still alive, very much alive at this point. The Lord said, "Take a heifer with you, and say, if anybody asks, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do." You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So, this is well before, obviously, uh, well, Saul is still very much a king uh, during this, this period. Um, uh, this starts out uh, 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 with that rejection of St. Paul. Verse, uh, again, then, verse 4. And Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Jerusalem, the elders of the town trembled, and they met him that you come in peace. Again, remember this is still this time where, where different people are not very well received by other tribes or wondering what they're doing here, uh, and they are in, in, uh, in competition with each other constantly. Uh, but this is where Samuel goes to the little town of Bethlehem. Samuel replied, verse 5, Yes, I come in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord, right here. It's going to be Eliab. He's got all the credentials. As I see him, he's about 6'9", weighs 300 pounds, <laughs> and could be a tight end for just about any kind of football. I think I've got my picture. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things the way man looks at them. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at them. Isn't that nice? It gives us a whole new understanding 
And that's the title of the sermon, sort of the theme of the sermon this morning. Um, where Rachel Jesus says to the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, which makes no sense whatsoever. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that's what it seems to be going on in this story of who is king. God looks at the heart all the way back. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Shammah didn't make the cut. Nor has the Lord passed by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Well, no, I've got one who's out in the back quarter. You take care of our sheep. Uh, but uh, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. But he is tending the sheep. So Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Jesse sent and had it brought in. He was ready. Uh, uh, that, that is the description, right? And whatever it means, it means healthy. It seems to be alive uh, and, and very, very much present. Uh, he was ready with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Thoughts? This obviously is uh, the Old Testament introduction to David. Um, and uh, as the story unfolds, and much of the rest of, of uh, First Samuel, uh, much of the rest of it and Second Samuel has to do, in one way or another, with the life and the leadership of uh, uh, of uh, David, uh, and finally the promise to King David uh, that uh, all nations. Almost a, a repeat of his promise to to uh, Abraham that out of out of your life, uh, David, all nations will be blessed because your kingdom will last forever. Thoughts? Okay, I'm going to make a big jump here right now, and I'd like to go. I, I let, I let other thoughts about David. I mean. He is a central figure in many respects of the uh, of the, uh, the Old Testament before the exile. But I'm going to I'm going to jump all the way to uh, uh, David's son, uh, and obviously that's so, uh, Sam, uh, Solomon. Solomon. Uh, any thoughts? Any more? Anything else you'd like to add about David at this point? Uh, David, yes, excuse me, yes, both of you. Yes. Right. Go ahead. I just think it's interesting that he kind of had peaks and valleys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that he could yeah. be a speaker and then yeah. he could be, you yeah. know, in God's yeah. favor. And yeah. then he ended up and married Uriah and, or, yeah, and Bathsheba and had four more sons, I guess. And it, <coughs> he has an interesting history. And then to say he will be. In power forever, yeah. Still, still today, uh, the lineage has it continued. What do they? What do the Israelites today have on their forehead? Star David. The Star of David. The Star of David. Yeah, to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, and, and it's also interesting, as you say, ups and downs or hills and valleys. Uh, 
you know, so many of these are uh, of his own making, uh, but there are the others. Just when it, you know, when, when you, I think of first when he's bringing the altar or the ark rather into Jerusalem, and he is dancing before the before the ark, he is absolutely overcome with joy and grace. And he takes off his robes and he dances like any commoner before that ark as it's brought into the city of Jerusalem or what will become the city of Jerusalem and what ends up. How does that happen? It ends up his wife is so embarrassed by him that she leaves him. All in the name of work, I suppose. <laughs> but from the, highest, from the highest moment in the Old Testament to the lowest moment in David's life. Go ahead. Well, he had plenty of other wives, so, you know. <laughs> Toss one aside. Well, I, I, I just find it kind of ironic that, that uh, here God has, has uh, established this king, Saul, and now he's basically flip-flopped because Saul's still alive, uh, yeah. and he's anointed another king, uh, or had another king anointed. Um, and, and it's interesting that some of the readings cause, say that even this caused some of the problems down the road with Israel, because I believe that Saul was from the tribe of Dan, right. which was one of the smaller tribes, kind of insignificant tribes, and, and David was from, I believe, from Judah, right? Yeah, right. And so, uh, this, you know, some people have read, think that this was part of a kind of a, a problem that arose years and years later when you know the, the, the separation of the tribes took place. Yeah. Well, and that exchange between David and Saul over all those years and the the the, the uh, final descent of Paul and the, and the hustling of David is a story you know, again all of us know. I chose not to go with that because we could, we know probably more about David in many respects than we do many of these minor characters. But I would like to go to, oh, we got about five minutes here, so we could uh, go quickly from the anointing of David, who <laughs> Goliath, and all of the other first and second Samuel, first and second Kings uh, stories about David uh, and the nation of Israel. Uh, but let's go to the high point in many respects of the Old Testament for a few minutes and we'll pick that up again next week. Let's go to uh, um, to uh, uh, First Kings okay, chapter 8 and again Samuel, First and Second Kings and chapter 8. I'll fill in just a little bit of the detail as we go to uh, chapter 8 because it is uh, one of the high points of the whole Old Testament. Um, David has a number of wives, uh, and the number of wives have a number of children, and so he's got a family. And uh, the more family you got, the more opportunities there are for getting crossways with each other, and that's a part of the story of David uh, until he has the one son, you remember, Absalom, who tries to take his dad's life. It goes, it, 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 that's probably some of the deaths. At any rate, David has uh, a, a son uh, from the least likely, probably, of all of his wives, which is Bathsheba with whom he has had an illicit relationship. Um, uh, and again, it's coming, uh, the story, it seems to me, is coming out of the wrong place. It should be uh, one of the high moments of romance and love and everything else, but it's not. It's an illicit relationship. But Solomon is, for reasons that um, we can only begin to imagine Solomon becomes the, the king after David. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there are, there are those, like David has his Goliath, Solomon has his high moments because he is known for his what? Wisdom. Yeah. Wisdom. 
is to, to be, and there are allusions to this, not big expansive but allusions to this, that that uh, important people, kings and priests and prophets, are coming to Jerusalem just to visit with Solomon, because his word and his wisdom uh, are known throughout the Middle East. It's kind of refreshing that he's not known for the size of his army or for his ability as a military leader, but he's known because of his wisdom. And you remember that dream that he has where God says, uh, you are the son of uh, my heart, David, uh, and so I'm going to give you anything you want, and what he asks for is wisdom. And that is given. Uh, he is so wise that he ends up with over 350 wives and 700 <laughs> compromises, which calls into question, it seems to me, a little bit his wisdom as he grows older. <laughs> I think that's one of the great anomalies of all the old scripture, or certain. But, but uh, Solomon. Uh, is associated with one of the truly great moments in the Old Testament and one of the uh, 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 great events. You know. So that's that's what I'm heading. Uh, and let's just read a few minutes. Uh, so, chapter 8. Okay? Uh, and this is unfair to, because David has said, I want to build you a temple, and God says, essentially, you are a man of blood. You are a man who has spent his entire life fighting and, and uh, uh, taking the blood of, of human beings. I do not want a man of blood to be the one who creates my temple. Uh, and so at that point, it becomes obvious that, uh, uh, that uh, David will, will not, but David, in uh, one of the most beautiful prayers in all of Holy Scripture in 2 Samuel, where David prays uh, and thanks God and, and begins to gather together all of enormous kinds of building materials, etc., and prepares so that when he dies, this comes into the hands and the heart and the wisdom of Solomon. And that's where we are in chapter 8. Um, uh, let's, let's just go uh, uh, page 240 in the red book. Um, 1 Kings chapter 5, just, uh, just a minute or two here. Verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, heading to, to, to the act of building and, and, uh, uh, and prayers and the dedication of the temple, but let's go to chapter 5 just for a couple minutes. And Hiram, king of Tyre, heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David. He sent his envoys to Solomon because he had always been on friendly terms with David. Solomon sent back this message to Hiram, and this is the message. You know, because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build the temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now, the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord told my father David when he said, Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name. So give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. My men will work with yours, and I will pay you for your men. Part of the wages you said, you know that we have no one so skilled in cutting timber as the Sidonians. Um, when Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, Praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this nation. Just a little aside, but it's a conversation between Hiram, who was at that point king of Syria to the north, where the Lebanons, or the Lebanons, where the, where the uh, yeah, the Lebanon part of that nation, uh, where, the, where the great, um, oh, all of a sudden I'm dropped, what's the name of the, name of the second son, 
that they use flag as a picture of the saint. I don't know. It's a of it. What's the tree? Anyway, it was a tree that became famous among other things because it was the chief building material in the building of the in the building of the temple. Cedar. What? Cedar. Cedar of Lebanon. Cedar. 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 Yes. Cedar. I didn't hear of that, but I'm, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> um, so so the, the temple was built and the temple was at that point uh, I would say one of the great wonders of the Old Testament both in its size and its beauty its attention to detail uh, the purposes for which this temple is built how it is used and becomes uh, even more than any king or any person, it becomes the symbol of God's presence in the Old Testament and uh, uh, the place where Israel gets its identity. Uh, that temple is going to be destroyed, or the first temple and the second temple, destroyed over history and in the process, Israel loses loses its identity, loses its purpose, uh, because the temple begins and becomes that, that, that center to its, its national life and identity, its, its, uh, its purpose. Um, but but let's, just, let's just start from, let's see, yeah, we've got to go to a minute. Let's just start, chapter 8, and this is where we'll start again next year. <coughs> then, Chapter 8, okay, page 243, chapter 8 of 1 Kings. Then King Solomon summoned into his presence at Jerusalem the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite family, to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. All the men of Israel came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of Ethanim, the seventh month, and when all the elders um, had arrived, the priests took up the ark and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tent of meeting and all the sacred furniture furnishings in it. The priests and Levites carried them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel a rather, rather impressive gathering of important people for this time. Uh, the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark sacrificing so many sheep and cattle they could not be recorded or counted. So then the priests brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim, which we read about earlier this morning. Put it beneath the wings of the cherubim, Cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and overshadowed the ark and its carrying pole. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they are still there here today. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Sinai or Horeb. For the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the priests withdrew, this is interesting, verse uh, 10, when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Uh, we'll we close with this, just some observations about the cloud itself. Um, how, did, uh, how did Israel find its way from Egypt to the Holy Land? Remember during the night there was a pillar of fire, right? For 40 years. And during the day there was this cloud uh, to, to uh, to call that, um, uh, how would you say, um, to call it just a cloud is a, um, it, it, 
probably about like um, calling Tom Landry uh, an average coach, an uh, average coach, best coach in the world. Absolutely. This, this cloud is, is um, uh, a cloud so thick and so deep, so brilliant, so foreboding, so present, uh, so overwhelming that people are actually uh, stunned into not just silence but driven to their knees. Uh, and that's the way this ends here um, uh, again. And the priest, yeah, when the, verse 10, when the priest withdrew from the holy place, okay, the temple, the cloud filled the temple. This cloud of God's presence filled the temple, and the priest could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. A couple other thoughts we can start here again next week. One of the thoughts is this is precisely what happened when they were up with Moses about to dedicate the tabernacle. Those who were to serve in the tabernacle could not get in because there was this, this absolutely extraordinary, impenetrable uh, kind of, of presence, this, this cloud. Uh, and the cloud comes up again and again as, as this, this uh, overwhelming a presence of God. <laughs> But where I was heading with this right now is if you read me, I want to just look at it real quick and close it. Uh, Matthew, uh, let's see, I think about 17. Uh, let's see if my memory is any good at all. Here we are. Uh, page, page 694. Page 694. 694, verse 17. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the last year of our Lord's life here on earth. He chased Peter well sweet. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of him, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, up in Mount Hermon. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, uh, three three shrines. That may be another way of, of, of describing it. One for you, one for Moses, and one for the life that we get here. And while he was still speaking, here we are, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. One of three times in the New Testament where we hear the voice of God. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus says, Jesus came and touched them, get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And so here we have this presence of God again, whether it's throughout the Old Testament or in this moment uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, if you remember that story, it's a story that is is taught and read uh, as Lent begins, the, the transfiguration. But there is, so throughout the Old Testament, we find this, 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 this cover and the appearance of God in this cover. But again, to call it simply a cover is just one great understatement. It is infinitely more than simply a cover. And with that, let's close with a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>